thank you for coming today. We're, um, we're going to talk about history, and we're going to make history, and we're going to be myth makers and myth busters. And I have a great quote I have to read, because I really like it, and it's guiding me right now in a nice way. So, by Kent Monkman, an artist who's Cree and Irish ancestry, who says, we cannot escape history, but we can question those who wrote it. <laughs> so just to keep that in mind as we go into the, the um, telling of history, remember it is um, just history. All right, so I'd like to, oh, we have a great panel today. And we're going to talk about uh, the founding of the Oxygen Art Center. And it has a bit of a history behind it, uh, a bit of a lead up, and we'll go through that and then get down to how Oxygen got to where it is today. Um, if, I just want to say, if you have a busy cell phone, with lots of people calling, you might take a moment here to turn your cell phone off. We are getting recorded, which is fabulous. Uh, and you go keep it here on camera, this document is me, and co-op radio is over here, and they're doing um, recording as well. Andrew. 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 So that is fantastic. So what we're, um, what inspired this is that you're surrounded by what is called Memory Palace, and this is the um, creation of our director, Miriam, who's standing right beside me here. Um, it is um, in celebration and while well, taking a moment to catch our breath and record our history, celebration over a decade and a half of arts programming from the Oxygen Arts Center. Uh, so what we have here is a wall of posters of what we've of the arts programming in the last uh, 14 years. No one can really, really, uh, really knows how many years, but we're saying over a decade and a half, and that's how ambiguous history is. Uh, and we also have um, books full of all kinds of information about the history of the center and the development of the center, and behind you monographs um, from, that have been produced on artists that have had shows here. So the Oxygen Art Center is, um, does arts programming, it does artist residences, and it does uh, exhibitions, and it does fabulous amount of arts education, and children programs, and youth programs, and cabarets, it's just fantastic. And we'll talk more about that towards the end. Um, so there's some of, of the artists that have had shows here before. And on this corner here is Memory Triggers. So the artists were invited, all the artists that have shown here, were invited to submit something from the show that they had here, or the residency, that would help uh, people remember that residency. It could be a new work, could be something from the older show. So if you, if you have some time at the end to look at that, you don't think you'll enjoy it, and it might trigger a memory. So on with our business today. Um, the, the subtitle is Resiliency, and I think as our four panelists here begin to talk about their involvement in the arts here and the arts education in Nelson, you'll see why that is the title, as indeed it's been an act of resilience. Um, I want to introduce them now and thank them for coming today. I have a little bio on them all. The far end of the table is Belk Elzinga. Um, Belk was born in the Netherlands, and she immigrated with her family to southern Ontario, where she bought and worked on a dairy farm. She traveled and became a nurse, and her captain, Brian, <laughs> met her captain, Brian, in Vancouver. With his, she said that, inspiration and support, obtained a Bachelor of Science from the University of Guelph and a BFA from the Emily Carton Institute of Art and Design. Belk has taught drawing, oil painting, mixed media, and art history at the Kootenai School of the Arts and the Oxygen Arts Center since... For, for quite a long, for that decade and a half, 97. 97. As well as being a founding member of the Oxygen Arts Center, she's also part of the Arrow Lakes Fine Art, or Alpha Guild, in the cusp, and continues to promote, promote local art by serving on the board of the Hidden Garden in New Denver. Um, Natasha Smith is on this end. Uh, Natasha Smith is practicing art, has been a practicing visual artist for 20 years, and is a self-defined teaching artist whose passion for teaching began 17 years ago at the Kootenai School of the Arts. Natasha's personal and physical environment inspired her most recent work, which combined printmaking, collage, and painting. Uh, Natasha taught at the Nelson Fine Arts Center, and FAC, and now teaches at the Oxygen Arts Center. Uh, this summer, she will be teaching at both Red Deer Summer Series in the Red Deer Summer Series and the Machosan International School Summer School of the Arts. Tasha has been an artist in residence in the Slocan Valley Schools as part of, as part of Art Starts, Artist in the Classroom Program, and Tasha plays an active role in the regional arts, culture, and heritage of the community through her work in the West Kootenai Regional Arts Council. 
just a note, we look forward to a show of Natasha's work coming up this year at the Kootenai Gallery. Not this year. Oh, <laughs> next year. <laughs> 2018. 1819, sorry. 1819, okay. Um, Verna Relkoff, beside Natasha there, is an author and editor. From 1991 to 2002, she was the director of the Kootenai School of the Arts, KSA, writing studio, and was a Kootenai School of the Arts founding board member. She has been a member of organizing committee, committees for, among other literary events, Terrain Festival, and from E to Z, Student Writers Weekend. Most recently, she was the principal, a principal of Mint Literary Agency. She is also a founding member of the Oxford Art Center. I should say these are all founding members, and there are some more I will list in a minute. And finally, and not is Tom waving here. Um, Tom is the author of more than 20 books of poetry, fiction and nonfiction. His, two, his 2012 poetry collection, Dirty Snow, won the Acorn Plantos Award. His 2015 collection of short fiction, The Shadows We Mistake for Love, won the 2016 Diamond Foundation Prize for Fiction. He formerly taught widely in BC Community College System, including Nelson's Kootenai School of the Arts. Um, uh, uh, he has also taught English, journalism, and writing at the David Thompson University Centre. So Tom has a long history here in the school system. Uh, he was a faculty and taught, and he's taught many BC Community College <coughs> Systems, and most recently was an associate professor at the University of Calgary, <coughs> from 2002 to 2010. Um, so these are four founding members that we chose to speak today, two issues about the, um, the start of the Austin Art Center, the history behind the Austin Art Center. There are several more founding members that, in, including myself, who uh, are not on the panel. Uh, not, and one is here today, Courtney Anderson. <laughs> and uh, Susan Andrews Grace, who is not with us today. Uh, Bridget Corfrey, who's no longer with us. Uh, Nicola, uh, Nicola Harwood, who is in Vancouver and sends her best, and we'll be speaking about her later. Jean Levitt, Hannah Lynn, Terry Ward, anybody? Kathy Verrigan, and I think that's it. So that's um, quite a crew that got things rolling for us. Uh, and some have stayed on into oxygen and some have left. Um, so these four are going to help us retrace history here. Um, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to sort of seed the conversation and help move it along a bit. And all four panel members will um, address the topics as they come up, or not, if they choose not to, and keep the baton going, the microphone. And we're going to move from, very chronological, from the past to the present for about 45 minutes, we're going to try to keep us rolling along, and then we'll open it to a question and answer period. So if you can save your questions, unless it's just burning, and you've done something absolutely ridiculous, then please speak up. Um, but other than that, that's kind of the format. All right, so I would like to um, start with the, putting the, the whole arts education, uh, Nelson as cultural hub, into some kind of historical context. And I think, uh, Tom, if you could just speak to this, and there's been a, a long history in this very small, isolated little town, mountain town of the arts and the persistence of the arts education and arts community uh, has moved through a variety of forms. And I thought, Tom, maybe you could bring us up to um, maybe the start of KSA, the Kootenai School of the Arts. Is this, is this on? You're on. The <clears throat> city of Nelson is unique in Canada in that in the 20th century, in the Dominion of Canada, only two post-secondary institutions were completely closed by government. And both, both of them were in Nelson, BC. <laughs> uh, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, quickly trace um, that. But the question, uh, which actually Deb asked me before, that I want you to bear in mind throughout this whole thing is, is that Nelson doesn't seem to accept those defeats, um, and, and the question is why, um, but we'll leave that for a minute. Post-secondary education in Nelson begins with a priest in a rowboat in, in the uh, west, west arm of Kootenai Lake. He looks up at the hillside of what is now Fairview, 
And he saw, he claims, he saw a, a university on the hill. The problem with the uh, Roman Catholic Diocese here was uh, not enough pre people, young men, becoming priests. And the idea was to start a, a post-secondary institution that, among other things, would um, help swell the priesthood. And that was the beginning of Notre Dame University, uh, which opens its first classes in 1950. The buildings, many of which have, have been rebuilt many times, but the, have the same uh, footprint, um, a lot of those were community initiatives. Patton Oak Hall, um, later renamed after that uh, unspeakable Leo Perra. Uh, Patton Oak Hall was um, absolutely built by um, the men, men and women of the diocese. And uh, as Notre Dame ran along uh, through, through the 50s, uh, it began to draw more and more public money. And like many uh, Catholic institutions, such as the University of Windsor, it, the line between how much, how much it's actually on, owned by the Catholic Church and how much by the public gets very blurry. Um, in the end, um, it was mostly funded by the public, and for various reasons, in 1977, the provincial government ordered the shutting down of Notre Dame. By that time, it had about 2,500 students and uh, had gone through many uh, permutations, but it included a, writing, a very vigorous writing program. In the meantime, in Nelson, an institution called the Kootenai School of Art, singular, one art, um, had, had formed and, and was operational. It was separate, but by the end of Notre Dame, there was a way in which you could get your, uh, if I remember right, the Bachelor of Fine Arts degree through Notre Dame, taking classes at uh, the Kootenai School of Art, singular. Uh, when, when NDU was shut in 77, there was a huge uproar in town, demonstrations, chasing the premier, <laughs> along the street when he visited, all that kind of stuff. So in 1979, two years later, the provincial government um, announced an, a new post-secondary institution for Nelson, and this was David Thompson University Center, which was a new thing, never been tried before, a consortium between the local community college, Selkirk College, and the University of Victoria. And, and that was quite an exciting place. Um, it was small enough that faculty um, really were developing program in much the way that we'll hear in a few minutes happened at, at uh, Cooney School of the Arts, plural. Um, what, one of the things that happened though with David Thompson was that the old Cooney School of Art, singular, was it, at that time induced to become the art department of um, David Thompson University Center. So that when in 1984, David Thompson University Center was closed, that's when Cooney School of the Art uh, came, came to an end. The closure of, um, of uh, David Thompson is, is a sad tale, uh, mostly having to do with um, very political decisions. In the fall of 1983, it was approved for another five years. Uh, also in the fall of 1983 was the uh, public sector general strike, which was largely supported in Nelson. And when that strike was sold out, um, then uh, the provincial government became very punitive against those areas that had been supportive of the strike, one of which was Nelson, and, and out of nowhere, um, DTOC was told to close uh, May the 1st, 1984. Thank you, Tom. Does anyone else have to, anything to add to that? No? So, Tom, are you, you were, were you um, instrumental in starting what we now think of as the Kootenai School of the Arts? Were you part of that early beginning in the was that? Uh, no, I was part okay. of it. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, you can speak to the early um, beginning. Well, of okay. There, there was a, a meeting. Uh, that it started, um, now, where, where was it? Up, up on, uh, not across from Patna. You know, the, the, uh, the sub-pub. Oh, the sub-pub. Sub sub yes, sub we had a big meeting in the yes. sub-pub. All right, let's see here. And it was decided to uh, try to get you know, KSA going again. And so we started meeting regularly. We met, met every Tuesday for years and put together KSA, re, re it. But we started with, like writing was one of the first programs that we started with. And because writing is su such a simple studio to bring in because all it takes is, yeah, is a teacher and a few desks. And, and so we started with writing. And then we brought in photography, we brought in painting, I, I can't remember all of the studios, but one by one. And we kept getting buildings from 
different people. The city has a couple empty buildings. So where now the lighting place is down on Front Street, that was one of our one of our areas. Oh, yes, yeah. I remember I came in right around then. Mm -hmm. And at that point though, the Kootenai School of the Arts had three years, didn't they? Three years program? Mm -hmm. Uh we yes, started they with two, yeah. three years. So they had really yeah. moved up. So that might have been the height, and that would have been what around nineteen ninety nine. Just to bring people yeah, up chronologically. Um, yeah. So I started at uh, Kootenai School of Art in 1997, and it came straight from Emily Carr at, the, at that time. And then uh, there were three year programs. Uh, the, uh, Courtney led the mixed media program. I was hired into art history and very soon took over being in charge of art and craft history. And, and then I started teaching in Courtney's um, mixed media program. So at that and, and at that time, the creative writing and the mixed media had the most students of all. We actually had three first-year classes at that time, mm -hmm. full That's what I classes. Remember, yeah. I mean, it was really yeah. quite amazing. Yeah. And students from all over the country. Yeah, as yeah. well as from yeah. the oh, yeah, interior. Yeah, it was a very yeah. vibrant school at the time. Yeah. And would someone maybe speak to the? internal climate of the school at that time? If there was any sort of seeds being planted for what is coming? Well, I just want to say that what I think um, it, it's important to say that what the, the idea of starting an art school again was came out of discussions of the committee that Verna was on. Um, because the question was, people in Nelson, for that weird reason that I don't understand, are so determined to have a post-secondary institution here. But the question was, what kind? Uh, yeah. Notre Dame had been shut, David Thompson had been shut. So, so if you're going to do something, what should it be? And, and okay. maybe Fernie can talk. I, I can talk a little bit about that, because it was, there was a conflict during that period of time. Because there were us, we were a rogue school, essentially, a rogue school. And you had the Nelson University Center that was trying to start up again. And they got a $14,000 grant from the city every year. And what they, they used for their faculty were retired professors and that sort of thing. And they were trying to recreate a traditional university. And again, we were the rogue school. I'm more, more, I was more concerned with the politics and the, the formation of this than the actual teaching part. But, uh, so, so Vern, excuse me, the rogue school is the Kootenai school. The we were the, the rogue school. We were the, the rogue arts school, yes. They and they yeah. were very contemptuous. And what we tried desperately to do was to work with them and say, okay, now listen, you know, um, we're, we're going to go ahead, but we want to work with you. And at that time, uh, the head of the school was uh, Patricia Murphy. And she was really opposed to what we were doing, so it made it really difficult. So what, we, what ended up happening is we split the pie. So we got $7,000 to rent, and they got $7,000. Anyway, we went ahead and we grew, and um, we were able to maintain our numbers and all of those sorts of things, and uh, went from there. And then that's when you joined the Falcon, when yes. we were well established. Yes. Yeah. And, and we got, we, we started, again, we were, we were mobile, we were building, working from building to building. And then we found out that there was that substation where KSA is now, was, uh, there was a possibility. And Corky Evans' secretary at that time, what was her name? I, I can't remember, anyway. Sa she, Sandy Corman. Sa oh. Sandy Corman. It? Yeah, it was Sandy Corman said, I think we can get you a grant. Anyway, she applied, and within three weeks, she got a $1.4 million. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, well, well infrastructure grant to, to build, and to build inside this building. So we were over the moon, because then we had, we had a place for the school. And then, it, then we had a really substantive footprint in town. Okay. I, I'm just going to take back to what Deb said regarding the climate, uh, because I joined in 2000. And I was very excited to be there. I mean, it seemed that there was an energy there that was, and, and I think yeah. everyone can agree that there was an energy there that was quite contagious. Um, the students that came from all over the country uh, were excited to be there. They were engaged learners, and the programming was excellent. Um, and at that point, I really felt I was part of something special. You know, I felt like there isn't anything quite like this. And they were employing practicing artists to teach. Um, so, you know, it wasn't to do with your academic potentially. It was to do with you as an artist and your, your passion for what you do 
and really, you know, been able to inspire and work in this community to, with the students. And this was very exciting. I remember feeling, you know, although I wasn't there for long, <laughs> you know, I felt that it was a pretty special place. Um, so I don't know who would like to go from there in terms of how, how did that special place suddenly change so dramatically? So Can I ask a question? Why did it become 